Hair to me is creation, it's an opportunity. It's important to understand the hair before you start coloring because you got to know where you're starting to know where you're going. Hair to me is something that allows you to express something and to truly create. Everything from the chemical process to what the hair is made up of, what happens when they both come together, it's really important that you know the ins and outs of the canvas that you're working on. In this episode, we'll discuss hair as a canvas, the science behind it, and how it reacts chemically. It's a good starting point if you've encountered a challenge while you're coloring, or if you just want to review some facts. Let's start with the canvas we put our hair color on, the hair fiber. We'll talk about the hair fiber's composition, structure, formation, and pigment, and how it relates to hair color. Composition is simply what the hair is made of. It's a mix of protein, moisture, lipids, pigment, minerals, and carbohydrates in various proportions. Proteins make up 70 to 80% of the hair and are related to the hair's strength. They play an important part in the hair coloring process. The stronger the hair is, the more predictable your hair color will be. Let's talk about the hair's structure. The outermost layer has approximately 10 layers and is the most protective part of the hair. This is called the cuticle. This is what we might consider the doorway to the innermost structure of the hair, or the cortex. The cortex is where the hair contains most of its moisture, protein, pigment, carbohydrates, and lipids, all of the most important things that make up the hair's fiber. The cortex is composed of melanin or hair pigment in varying quantities and soft, pliable, spiraling chains of protein, which give the hair its strength and elasticity. The cortex is an important part of the permanent hair coloring process. There's one other part of the hair that has no known function. Some people have it and some don't. It's the medulla, the very center or core of the hair fiber itself. There are two different types of natural pigment in the cortex of the hair, eumelanin and pheomelanin, and everyone has combinations of both. Every hair has melanin in varying concentrations. Eumelanin are brown to black granules found in darker levels of hair in higher concentrations. Eumelanin may be more resistant to lift. Pheomelanin are small red to yellow particles usually found in lighter levels of hair. Gray hair and white hair have subtle differences in their composition. Gray hair still contains a bit of pigment, while white hair has an absence of pigment, or it's dormant. In formulating hair color, we need to take this into consideration. The cuticle, the cortex, and the medulla, which make up every strand of hair, collectively impact the process of hair coloring. How much impact depends upon several factors, including the collective strength. If the cuticle has many layers, and these layers are extremely thick, strong, and smooth, the hair color may take longer to penetrate. If the hair has fragile layers that are broken into zones, the hair color may penetrate too quickly or not evenly. Or if the hair is very dense and has a high percentage of cortex, it may take more time for the color to develop and realize a color change. The physical properties of the hair are also important when you're coloring. The diameter of an individual hair strand, it is generally described as fine, medium, or coarse. Hair color formulation adjustments usually need to be made before or during the service. If you're working on fine hair, for example, it may be more receptive to receiving color than coarse, hard to lift hair. So you may need to adjust your timing, application, and products. Another factor to check before you color is the density or abundance of the hair. This is the amount of hair per square inch. Hair density is a genetic factor and it may be sparse, average, or thick. The density of hair also needs to be taken into consideration when you're coloring. It helps define the size of the partings. For an all over global application, hair with sparse density may require quarter inch partings, while hair with average to thick density may require eighth inch partings to ensure proper product saturation. Once you know the texture and density of the hair, you will need to determine its condition. This step is vital to achieving successful color results. You can tell by looking and feeling the hair, whether it's dry or oily, virgin or chemically treated, over-processed, dull or shiny. The hair should also be physically evaluated to determine if it has good elasticity or if it's porous or damaged. Hair that can absorb and retain moisture has good or acceptable porosity. Varying degrees of porosity result when the hair is longer or older, exposed to environmental elements, and or regularly styled with heat implements. Porosity needs to be considered when selecting hair color products. 
It determines formula mixtures and processing times. When hair is overly porous, it can easily become structurally weak and damaged. This may cause the hair to be weak and brittle when dry or spongy and stretchy when wet. Damaged hair may start as a small crack in the cuticle layer, but may eventually deepen and fray the cortex. Hair color may over deposit or grab, appear uneven or even spotty, or it might not be retained at all. When the hair is weakened or in poor condition, we recommend treatments to ensure the best possible hair color results. We'll talk more about pre-treatments in another episode. For now, it's important to know that while most hair can be brought back to a state that is acceptable for hair coloring, there are some exceptions where it's best to just simply send the client home with a great new haircut, the right shampoo and conditioner, and an at-home treatment. Simply explain and reschedule for a more successful color service in the future.